All right, so well-known amateur and contester, uh, Tim Duffy, K3LR, is our speaker tonight. And uh, Tim runs a, is a sponsor of a, a, a great multi-multi uh, contestation down in Pennsylvania, and is also a well-known, well-known uh, uh, person at DX Engineering. And with that, Tim, I'll let you go ahead. Okay, Bruce, is the audio okay? Yes, sir. Probably louder than, than I am, so it's good. All right, great. Well, good evening, everyone, and thanks so much for the invitation and the uh, uh, to, to speak to the club. Clubs are the backbone of this hobby, so it's always uh, good to uh, talk to uh, clubs. And I'm going to uh, sh share my uh, screen here. <clears throat> So we're going to talk about K3LR. I'm uh, just north of Pittsburgh on the Ohio-Pennsylvania border. And uh, this is a, a young K3LR, age 13, uh, just after I passed my general exam. And uh, some of the QSL cards on the wall there uh, are still active hams today. So it's it's been a good 50-year uh, run here. Uh, so here's where K3LR is located. If uh, any of you have driven on Interstate 80 across Pennsylvania and Ohio, uh, you may have uh, seen the 14 towers that are here because uh, it, it's right uh, on the south side of Interstate 80. Mm -hmm. And uh, you can find out a lot of information on my website, k3lr.com. There are drone videos and lots more photos there as well. But uh, I'm a about uh, 65 miles northwest of Pittsburgh, also about 65 miles to Erie, 65 miles to Cleveland, and uh, about 55 miles to Akron, Ohio. So uh, again, on Interstate 80, on the south side is where all the towers are located. It uh, encompasses uh, 14 acres. And the real secret to how uh, well K3LR works is the very rapid drop off towards Europe and Japan. Um, the uh, I'm not exceptionally high, but the the drop off to the riverbed towards Europe and Japan uh, is almost 275 feet. So that that accounts for a, a very good ground enhancement of the signals here. And taking a look overhead, uh, there are, uh, as I said, many towers. Uh, the 160 meter array. This is on the north end of the property. Uh, two four squares on 80 meters down here in the center. Um, and it's basically just like stacking Yaggies. You get two four squares, you get uh, three dB more gain. And it's broadside on Europe. And then a large tower for 40 meters. And in the middle where the house is, is uh, 15 meters, has a, a big stack, 10 meters, another stack, and 20 meters. Uh, so there are 11 operating positions here in the shack, two on 80, two on 40, two on 20, two on 15, two on 10, and one on 160 meters. Uh, there are no work antennas here. Uh, I've concentrated just on HF contest bands. So the 40 meter tower is um, has uh, three full size, four element uh, OWA 40 meter Yagis. Each one of these Yagis, uh, the reflectors are 75 feet long. Uh, they weigh 410 pounds. And uh, the two that are side mounted are on ring rotators. In fact, every uh, antenna here that is on the side of a tower is on a ring rotator so that we can rotate them around the tower. On the top of the mast is a uh, 10 meter Yagi. Uh, at 275 feet. So for 40, it's 260 over 190 over 120 feet. So Tim, I have a question. Yes. So you're at 275 feet. So that tower has to be registered with the FAA and lit? Yes. Uh, the, the two tall towers here are, are both uh, registered with the FCC and also the FAA and are lit. And you can see that uh, here in the reflection, uh, you can see that this tower is also painted per the FAA. 
Thank you. Okay. And uh, just to get a little bit of scale, the 40 meter Yaggies are very large antennas, but um, you know, when you put them up high, they don't look as big. And uh, also there are four uh, antennas on 10 meters on this uh, tower as well. And they are used for the second station on 10 meters. And also uh, there's a horizontal wall or flag at 160 feet. This is for 160 meters for receiving only. And it looks like a four element 15 meter Yagi, but it actually has wires in between the uh, the elements here. This is fiberglass and the, there are two rectangles that form the horizontal wall or flag. And here's the uh, looking up at the 40 meter tower. You can see just how how much aluminum is packed on this tower. Uh, also, the 20 meter tower has got four six element uh, 20 meter Yaggies at 230 over 170 over 110 over 50 feet. And on top of the mast is a 80 meter dipole. Taking a look down the 20 meter tower at some of the other antennas, the, uh, the two lower 20 meter Yaggies. And then in the middle of this tower are two uh, 40 meter Moxons. These are uh, two element 40 meter Yaggies. And you can see the T elements here that uh, provide the uh, loading. So these elements are only 46 feet long and they're loaded by the T elements, uh, W6NL Moxons for the second station on 40 meters and taking a look up the busy 20 meter tower. Again, the, the ring rotators around the tower. And uh, for 10 meters, there are eight element Yaggies on the, for the run station. There's four, one, two, three, and then the fourth one down here. And then for 15 meters, four high, seven element Yaggies. And all these Yaggies are on 50 foot booms. And then there's also a six meter Yaggy above, here, this is a 10 element uh, six meter Yagi. I use it primarily for finding noise. Um, it's also used uh, remotely by K3UA in the summertime to work sporadic E, uh, it, but it's a little too high really for, for really good sporadic E performance at 175 feet. But uh, the, you, you notice these, um, the optimized wideband array of the OWA uh, has the first director very closely coupled to the driven element. And that provides uh, very low SWR. Uh, back in 2018, we had an unfortunate problem where a, a drunk driver got off the road and hit one of the guy anchors on the 20 meter tower. So we had to take, this is the old tower that we had to take down. And this is the new tower going up with the crane and a hundred ton crane in here to uh, tear down the old tower and then put in the new tower. And so this is the new tower going up. These uh, towers are pyrod, which are solid steel legs, not uh, pipe like Rome, but they're very strong. And uh, so here's ring rotators going into position. And the top of the pyrod tower for 20 meters at 230 feet with the DX engineering uh, thrust bearing on top. And you can see these uh, uh, all solid steel horizontals and very, very strong tower. This is two of the six element beams for 20 meters. Again, using the OWA feed system. You can see that first director is very close to the driven element. It makes the driven element think it's very fat. And that's what causes the SWR to stay very low across the entire band. And this is the top six element 20 going into place and uh, tower crew uh, hooking on. And of course, uh, these are steps so that we can get up to the 80 meter dipole for any maintenance. And then we used uh, FaceTime to be able to see the rig expert analyzer remotely from the top of the tower to make sure everything was good. A little bit more about the OWA design. This, this is the driven element on 40 meters. And so this is two and a half inch outside diameter tubing that is used. Uh, remember these elements are 70 plus feet long 
And so, uh, but with the OWA design, it allows you to feed it just like a dipole. And so uh, we all we have uh, a rule here at K3LR that all the driven elements have their center conductors of the coax on the right side, known as right on red. And that's very important from a phasing perspective. And you can see the, the heavy uh, G10 glass epoxy insulator plates. And so here is the uh, 40 meter beam getting ready to go up and in 2019, we replaced uh, 40 meter Yaggies here with uh, new updated designs. And you can see that even though the, this uh, element is very robust. It still sags about 30 inches. And here's the first director, very close to the driven element. And uh, another shot of the massive 40 meter Yagi. This is uh, one of three. And you can see the trucks on Interstate 80 in the background. And uh, the crane back in to uh, take care of putting the 40 meter Yaggies in place. The crane uh, makes it. Uh, very efficient to place the Yaggies. And uh, there are four of these geocrons down here in the shack, K3LR. Two of them are the digital versions, and two of them are the old mechanical versions. Uh, we also use very large heliacs to make sure that we keep our losses very low here at K3LR. So the rule is no more, no more than one dB of loss in any one of the feed lines to any of the antennas. For 160 meters and transmitting, and we do receive on this as well, is a, uh, this is a full size quarter wave, so it's 120 feet, but around it are four T wires. And uh, I've written this up uh, three times in the ON4UN book. Uh, this is a directive array. It's actually a three element uh, parasitic Yagi, so vertical Yagi with the tower being the driven element. And then uh, this left-hand yellow wire, if we put a small inductor in series with it, connect it to ground, it becomes a reflector. We float the two blues, the front uh, yellow element, we uh, just connect that to ground. It's a director inherently, and you get a reflector, driven element, director, three elements, gives you about 6 dB of gain and 30 dB of front to back. And if you float all four of them, it's an omnidirectional system. This is the bottom of one of the T wires. It has to have a, a, a radial system just like the driven element, 120 radials. The driven element, though, itself is so far away from the shack that we had to feed it with inch and five eighths, even though it's on 160 meters to maintain low loss. And there are 300 radials underneath the uh, tower here. And uh, for 80 meters, uh, we talked about the two four squares. So there's eight towers involved. Uh, and uh, this is the ground system broadcast style put in for the 80 meter verticals and the four center verticals. And you can see the extensive uh, straps. And a few years ago, we replaced the high towers with actual aluminum towers from Universal Tower in Michigan. And uh, all the sections are welded together. And so it makes for a very low loss system, 60 feet of tower, and then a 10 foot stinger on top that is tuned to the exact same frequency as all the other 80 meter verticals. And here is the uh, verticals going into place. And again, the bottom showing the extensive radio system and the custom DX engineering insulators. And here's one of the four squares, one, two, three, four towers for one of the four squares. And uh, tuning them, making sure they're on the exact same frequency. Using the Comtech systems uh, hybrid to feed the four squares so that uh, electronically rotatable in four different directions. We also have four squares on 40, 20, 15, and 10 meters. Here's the one for 20 meters, which is right, almost right on the interstate. Here's the interstate right there. And uh, this is the four square. We use this for receiving on the second station, four square on 15 meters. And for receiving on 80 and 160 meters, we use the high Z eight circle. 
We also have a high Z four square. These are 23 foot verticals. And then again, a hybrid combiner in the middle. You can see here's one of the 23 foot verticals, another one of them uh, for the eight circle, which allows uh, directional receiving in 45 degree increments. The inside of the uh, controls for the high Z and chokes to make sure that the coaxes stay dead cold. And uh, here I am working with my good friend, Tim W3YQ to tune up the array and uh, lots of RG6 cables to make this whole thing happen. This is the base of one of these 23 foot verticals, uh, just two ground rods. And then inside the control box is a buffer amplifier to take the high impedance a vertical to 75 ohms, and then two chokes again to make sure that everything stays cold. And the uh, these are all the buffer amps that it takes to power things here at K3LR. Inside the choke box is 26 turns of small 75 ohm coax on a number 31 toroid, and this develops over 10,000 ohms of common mode impedance. The house of K3LR was built in 1865. It's been fully restored and uh, everything has been added to this house, such as electricity, running water, air conditioning, and oh yes, a world-class amateur radio station. There's, we have our own uh, 50 kilowatt transformer from the Pennsylvania Power Company. We're the only ones on this transformer. And if for some reason, Penn Power fails, we have a 50 kW Kohler generator that comes online within seven seconds of a power outage. This is an eight cylinder Chevy engine running on natural gas. This is the shack at K3LR, 11 operating positions. Uh, you can see here the two positions for 80 meters uh, and uh, on the left, and then the position for 160 meters here straight away. There are two inlets for coax cables. They're all buried. And all the control lines and everything is kept track of in a notebook. We have ground rods right underneath the operator's feet. There's 13 eight-foot ground rods on the floor. And here are some, uh, some of the operators that operate at K3LR. Over 160 different operators have operated from here, including uh, guys like Ward N0AX editor of the ARL handbook and antenna book, and also uh, Doug Grant, K1DG, very uh, famous author and super contest operator. And uh, here's Phil, K3UA from Pittsburgh. Uh, Phil and I have been friends for 50 years operating with uh, K1DG. And N6MJ from Los Angeles, California, uh, enjoying 15 meters at K3LR. The 10 meter second position, you can see the four rotator boxes, the 10 meter radio, amplifier, and control systems. We also have custom designed antenna switches here. We talked about the three high stack on 40 meters. Um, in this uh, particular selection, all three are being fed. So 33% of the power goes to each one of the antennas. And all the impedance matching is done on the tower and the operator can select any one or all three or the top two, the bottom two, et cetera. For the four high stacks, there are 10 combinations and the operators have to figure out which is the best at any given time. Here are the two operators on 15 meters. They have to work together because there is an interlock that keeps, uh, make sure that only one transmitter at a time on a band can be active. So here the operators have selected the bottom three known as bot three, which is 120 over 80 over 40. And they also have a heads up display so they, they know exactly which antennas are online. I like the W4 watt meters, very simple, very straightforward, but we had actually worn out the SO239, so put new ones on, size does matter. And uh, the three high stack on 40 meters is the largest 40 meter antenna array in the world. 
most every amplifier in here is a single band amplifier that I've designed. And uh, it's a single 8877 running 1500 watts output. And each one of them has their own 4000 volt power supply. But amplifiers uh, made out of triodes like the 8877 are very simple when you don't have a band switch. This is the run position for 20 meters. Here's the four rotator boxes that control the four high stack. And side by side, a 7850 and a 7851 for the two stations on 20 meters. The two stations on 10 meters and the 160 meter station. I do the uh, CW contests the DX contest on 160, and John N2NC does the phone uh, legs of the contest here. Lots going on with the uh, DX engineering noise canceling controller to phase two antennas together, the horizontal wall or flag control, as well as uh, uh, the DX loop, etc. Lots of antennas here. We use the Bose QC15s for our headphones active noise canceling, and also at every position, the IC7851. Uh, just a robust, rugged radio with fantastic ergonomics. Uh, my good friend Al N5UM, who comes up and operates uh, 75 meters during the phone contest with me on 75, and sometimes Al takes a little nap uh, at about 4.30 in the morning, that's okay. We've replaced all the desktop computers with these Intel NUCs, that's N-U-C. It's a full Windows uh, computer that runs on 13.8 volts as a solid state hard drive. And this is what does all the logging. It's very efficient from a size perspective and it's RFI quiet. To share the, the uh, two four squares between the two 80 meter stations, is the 80 meter XL twin turbo plus two, thanks to W8WWV. And we have, wanna make sure that we're interference free. So these are the um, uh, harmonic filters. Uh, actually these uh, started out life out at K2GL and uh, we have high power harmonic filters to beat down the harmonics from 160 meters through 10 meters. When the operators aren't operating, they're hanging out at the DX barn, and that's uh, DX gas, which used to be very popular back in the 60s and early 70s, and I managed to get a sign here, and at the end of each contest, we light up the DX sign. Inside is a full uh, kitchen, uh, a couple of restrooms, just showers, and sleeping for eight upstairs along with my QSL card collection of over 100,000 QSLs. Operators having fun at K3LR, that's what it's all about. Um, we, they work hard and they also have a lot of fun. And uh, John K1AR with Andy N2NT on phone and KM3T taking a well-deserved uh, break in the middle of the night on 20 meters. We use the DX engineering foot switch or PTT on sideband. And this is the lockout box between the run and the multiplier station at K3LR. So make sure that only one transmitter is on the air at a time. And uh, here's another view of the lockout box. This, is, uh, this LED tells the second station whether or not the run station is on the air. You can see with the red, uh, LED, it's on the air, and he will be locked out. And if it's not on, then he's free to transmit. Um, showing the 20, the second station on 20, 150 over 100 feet are the two Yaggies, and BIP is both in phase. Operators having fun, that's what it's all about. Otis NP4G from Puerto Rico. He's, uh, he's great with Spanish and some Portuguese, as well as English. And, and Otis was on the uh, Bouvet trip as well here uh, very recently. And uh, here's Phil, K3UA, with Justin G4TSH from London, England. Justin likes to come over for CQ Worldwide 
and operate on ADCW. Here you can see almost every position is occupied. The two guys here on 40 meters, two guys here on 80, 160, only one guy at this particular time on 15, an open seat on 15, and then the two guys on 10, and the two guys here on 20 meters. I'm very uh, proactive with the youth operating. Uh, back in 2019, we had a youth team here for the WPX phone contest. This is Bryant, KG5HVO, along with Violetta, KM4ATT, on 20 meters at K3LR. And uh, Levi, uh, K6JO, and VE7DZO on 40 meters. Uh, this group operated uh, 48 hours in the multi two category. Uh, six youth operators, they did all the operating. Um, the, the adults' job was to make sure that they were fed and had enough water and went and uh, got some sleep. They had projected that they would do really good if they worked 3,700 QSOs. At the end of the contest, this team of multi-two operators, youth operators, all under the age of 23, had worked six over 6,000 contacts. That was good enough for number one in the U.S., number one in North America, number four in the world. And uh, Marty NN1C was a big part of this organization as well. Tommy HA8RT from Hungary. It's the first time anyone in his family had traveled to the U.S. So this was a, a really fun thing, and uh, I was very proud of this operation. Uh, I also host K2M. The uh, 13 colonies, K2M, they'll be here on July 1st. We'll be doing it again. And uh, they'll make several thousand QSOs in one day. Uh, and we also have youth as part of the K2M experience. We get visitors from all over the world here. Uh, here's a visitor from Finland. And also Riley Hollingsworth, K4ZDH, along with the expeditioner Al W8HC. Uh, we keep track of the statistics. And we, we know what our high watermarks are for countries and QSOs for every contest and how we finished. Uh, we're also very active on the reverse beacon network. I've got uh, this rack of computers has now been replaced by NUX. And so this is the uh, all, all the computers that are needed for the SDRs. There are six Perseus SDRs here at K3LR that contribute to the reverse beacon network. Lots of ferrite here at K3LR to make sure everything stays very RF quiet. Power distribution, everything is done with analog power supplies. There are no wall warts here. And uh, we make coffee one cup at a time. And also this is the, the snack table that it takes to power a team of 13 operators for 48 hours. We have uh, Chef, Chef Sal, WM2H from Houston, Texas, and uh, he's a great operator, but he's an even better chef. So we're very happy to have uh, Chef Sal, and he's getting ready to put things in the smoker. He's in charge of the kitchen and feeding all the K3LR operators. And uh, this is uh, uh, N2NC makes breakfast on the phone contest, and I take care of making breakfast for everybody in the CW contest and the operators contest and eat at the same time. We use WinTest for our logging software. You can see this is the logging screen. Uh, it's a, a French program that's very popular in Europe. We've been using it since uh, 2006 and keeps track of our score. Here's, here's a great score and we're, we're getting back to this now, you know, where you have over 3000 contacts on 10 meters in 170 countries. Thank you for sunspots. K3LR QSL cards. I make sure that everybody that works K3LR from a DX perspective gets a QSL card. And so this is a box going to the ARRL Bureau. I, I really like uh, t-shirts. So team K3LR and CW. After the contest is over, we get on 3830 the real 3830 on the air and exchange scores with other multi-op stations, 
such as W3LPL, NR4M, uh, K1LZ, uh, KC1XX. So it's, uh, it's an intense couple of minutes as everyone reads their scores. We even participate in RTTY contests. Sometimes we win a plaque. So here is uh, one, one of the teams. This was in 2017. I-L-T-H-R-S, I love this ham radio stuff. And uh, Sal brought along his girlfriend, Olivia, to help with the cooking duties. But um, some familiar faces, W2RQ, K1DG, W5OB, and VE3EJ, uh, K1AR. We do it because we're great friends. And uh, CW team in 2014, Here's a CW team in 2018 with K1TO and K5GN, great uh, operators that have operated here at K3LR. And some of these guys I've known for over 50 years. And uh, what, what a way to go to operate, you know, all weekend long and share this amateur radio contesting experience. I'm very proud of the fact that on weekends, we host tours here at K3LR, um, and uh, this is a, a particularly uh, neat club. This is the University of Pittsburgh Pitt Panther Radio Club, W3YI, with their advisor. And uh, here at K3LR, station tour, get on the air, talk about amateur radio, talk about uh, college, talk about life after college. So uh, that is a glimpse of what is going on here at K3LR. And I am available for any questions. Uh, Jim has asked if you have questions to come up and speak into the into the laptop because the microphone is not very loud. So, all right. So, Tim, I have a question uh, on a number of bands. You run two stations uh, at the same at the same time. I guess one is the run station and the other is the multiplier station. Right. How do they how do they sequence that? Does the multiplier station, if the red light isn't on, just call the malt, or yeah. does uh, and so and so how much interference? Let's say the run station is listening to someone who's calling. How much interference do they get, and how disruptive is that? Uh, they get some interference, as you can imagine. They're operating within you know uh, fifty kilohertz or twenty five kilohertz of each other, but. Uh, we use those four squares to receive on, and that gives us polarization diversity. And uh, that way, we're already, you know, uh, several dB down. So there is some interference, but it's not not bad at all. Okay. All right, we've got another question. Hang on a second. So, Bill, give me a name and call sign. Uh, it's it's Bill. I'm K1NS. And can you hear me? Yes, Bill. Go ahead. Uh, I live in a in a townhouse condominium unit, so I don't have the luxury of being able to put up antennas like you do. If I get a, a wire antenna, I'm I'm lucky. And so I put up an antenna a few years ago using DX Engineering's uh, um, um, what do you call it? You put a larger rod inside a smaller rod. Telescoping. telescoping, that's the word I want. Using the telescoping six foot long aluminum rods. And I made a 42 foot vertical. It's freestanding with no guy wires. People in my condo don't even know it's there. They can't see it. And it's a great antenna. So just want to thank you for selling that rod. That's a really good product. And one little extra thing I did is at the very end, the last rod you make has got a quarter inch diameter hole in the middle. And if you go to Home Depot, they sell quarter inch aluminum rods and four foot lengths. It makes a really nice finishing end for that. You can use to tune the antenna by sliding up and down in the last piece. So thank you for the antenna. Great. I'm, I'm glad it's working for you, Bill. That's right. Hey, Tim, this is Jim, NAVIM. Uh, yes, Jim. My question is, you run everything underground. Do you run all that coax in conduit or you do, do you direct bury it? And how so, do you keep the moisture out? It's all direct buried, and I don't worry about the moisture. Um, you know, it, it's, it sits in sand trenches, and uh, 
you know, all, all this, uh, all of the coax and all of the control cables are ready for direct bury. So uh, I gave up on conduit a long time ago. All right, thanks. Any other questions? Oh, stand by, Tim. Tim is just a fountain of knowledge. He is. Hi, Tim. Hi. Uh, I'm, you? <laughs> I'm Dennis, K1 LG2. Or as I like to say, one last good question. You know, it, it's it's just so impressive all, you, all that you're doing. What companies do you really, you know, kind of zero in on? Uh, some of the radio, you know, Icom, Kenwood, you know, Yesu. Which ones do you do you favor? Um, which ones do you stay away from because of certain situations, frequencies, bands that don't work in one situation where another would be better, one company over another? And I know this, is, you're not going to be able to answer this one. How much money does this cost? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll answer that one first. I have no idea. I'm going to sit there and listen to you. <laughs> I have no idea. And I, I've not kept track for good reason. Um, but I, I will tell you that uh, I have, uh, I've been a very happy ICOM radio owner for many years. Uh, I started out with the IC-765s back in the uh, 80s and uh, IC-781s and IC-7800s. And now we're at the 7851. And here in the next year or two, I think there'll be another uh, big uh, radio. Uh, but I, you know, the, the radios from Kenwood and Yesu are very, very good. Uh, I just, I happen to like the ergonomics of the ICOM radios. Uh, the reliability of these radios is is off the charts. It's really, really good. And uh, and I've tried them all. I've tried L-Craft. I've tried the Flex. I've tried them all. And um, the operators here seem to be very happy with the ICOM radios as well. So the 7851 is what we've standardized on. Anybody else? Thank, thank you, Tim. That's a round of applause. I don't know if it came through on the microphone or not, but uh, thank you very much for being our guest speaker this month. And uh, I assume if anyone has questions, they can email you. Yes, absolutely. Um, yes, Bruce, at K3LR at K3LR.com. Um, also, you know, look at the website, K3LR.com. And Bruce, thanks so much for the invitation tonight. It was great to speak to the club. And to those of you who are DX Engineering customers, thank you so much for your business and your trust. And if you have trouble, now you know the CEO. And you can come, you can come right to me with uh, whatever issue you might have. And uh, to those of you who are not DX Engineering customers, give us a shot. Give us a chance. I think you'll be pleasantly surprised how well the order goes and the advice that you get from uh, the team that we have here. But again, thanks, Bruce. Tim, uh, one last thing. One of the guys said, oh, uh, get Tim to come up on field day and operate with us. <laughs> well, I'm hosting my local club here uh, for field day. We'll be W3JTV, and uh, I'd love to come up, but uh, I, I'm going to be a little busy with about 50 club members here. Gotcha. Well, we'll look for you. Thanks very much, Tim. Appreciate it. All righty. Good night, Bruce. Thanks, guys. 73. Good night. No, thank you very much.